um, and thank you all for sticking around. This is always one of everybody's favorite panels. It's the judges panel, a view from the bench, and you know this year we've got a, a great panel. Uh, last year, Judge Brown participated as a, a private citizen, and we're delighted to, to have him back as a United States District Court judge, um, and always happy to have Judge Wood uh, from the Southern District of Georgia, who's been a great uh, friend of this program and, and is particularly uh, has important meaning for me because in 2004, when Judge Wood was the U.S. Attorney, she gave me my opportunity to, to be an Assistant United States Attorney. So I hope she doesn't regret it, but I will, I will always be grateful for that. And our uh, moderator today is Bill Shepard, and, and Bill uh, has each year really done a lot of work in helping us put this program on, really going all the way back to when we first started. Bill is a uh, former head of the American Bar Association Criminal Justice Section. He practices at Holland and Knight has offices in West Palm and D.C. I can imagine which office you spend more time in, hopefully. Uh, but Bill's got a, a, a great national practice in, in internal investigations, government investigations, and, and some civil fraud matters. Uh, he is always in important matters and is a, a great resource, uh, not just in South Florida, but throughout the country. So Bill, thanks again uh, for agreeing to, to be here. And let's give a welcome to our uh, judges panel. Well, thanks, and, and it's great to be here. That was a, an outstanding launch. There was quite a bit of debate at my table about uh, bread pudding and whether it should have uh, raisins or not. I would encourage all of you who uh, have a feeling on that to please contact me afterwards because I need some supporters. Um, but uh, this is a, a really important program, and it's a great conference to have this program because um, you know there are not a thousand people at this conference. This is a real opportunity to talk to uh, the judges who make decisions that affect and impact the lives of your clients. Um, regardless of whether you represent an individual, represent a company, represent a victim of a crime. Um, this is, a, is a, a real substantive opportunity that I hope people will take advantage of with the, the question and answer. Um, and feel free uh, afterwards to, to, to ask general, non-case specific questions um, to the people on our panel. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think, uh, I think another thing about this, it, and it's interesting that we follow on the, on the heels of that Supreme Court panel, um, from which I am still tired. Um, <laughs> but uh, but those, uh, those lofty topics that were discussed uh, about decisions in, in our nation's highest court uh, are certainly important for us to know and understand and, uh, and uh, include in our arguments when we're, uh, when we're before the trial court. But it's really at the trial court um, where most of us operate and where the real decisions that are gonna impact our clients' lives uh, are gonna be you know, most heartily felt on them and frankly on their families, right? It's the, the family's in the district court, the family's not going to the Supreme Court, right? Um, and I think that um, this is just a great opportunity. And so we, we heard a little bit about the panelists, but I do wanna say a few more things uh, before I turn this over to, uh, to our speakers and, and give you a little bit more, uh, more background on them. Judge Wood, uh, in addition to her poor hiring practices at the U.S. Attorney's Office that fortunately did not hold up her confirmation. Um, just kidding. Um, she, uh, she was the U.S. Attorney for her district, um, is a graduate of Georgia both undergrad and law school, um, and was the chief judge uh, for a period of almost 10 years, I believe. I'm limited to seven or I would still be it. Like I said, almost 10. Um, and, uh, and, and really brings a, a wealth of experience, uh, also having spent a, a, a significant time of practice uh, in private practice before she, uh, she entered government service. Judge Brown, as you heard, uh, one of the newest uh, district court judges in the United States of America. We are lucky to have him here. Uh, he was a, uh, a Georgetown undergrad and Georgia law. Um, I must tell you that he was also in my freshman class at Georgetown, uh, and we always knew there would be great things for him. When I called him and I said, I can't believe you're a federal judge and you're gonna be on this panel, I was worried he was gonna say, Shep, I'm afraid, I can't believe you're not in prison. So, <laughs> you know. 
but uh, he held back, and, uh, and we appreciate him being here because not only does he serve as, as the newest uh, federal judge, but he also um, brings great experience from the Southern District of Florida where he was an AUSA, um, was an AUSA in Atlanta, and for a long period of time had a very successful practice at uh, Austin and Byrd uh, handling public corruption cases, uh, serious fraud cases, a whole host of matters um, that, uh, that many of you might be handling now uh, in private practice. And then at the end, uh, Professor Albin, who joins us uh, from the Cumberland School of Law, who has a significant uh, background uh, in the courts herself, um, both at the state level and at the federal level. I was a state prosecutor for more than a dozen years, um, so I have a, prof a uh, special place in my heart for those who are in the state court system. Uh, she was in the state court system as an assistant district attorney in Massachusetts and Texas, uh, but then was at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alabama and has a, served a very significant role there in their uh, appellate practice. And so now she shares, uh, shares that with her students and I hope can, uh, can help uh, take us all back to our days in law school where we were uh, learning things that would be, be helpful to us and she's actually got real practical knowledge to go along with it. So, uh, so that's our panel. I think we're, uh, we're all very fortunate to, to have the three of them. I'm gonna turn it over to Judge Wood uh, to talk to us a little bit, um, and each of our panelists will, will give you a few minutes uh, uh, on their own thoughts on how to best form an argument uh, in various settings, and then we'll go through some, some different areas of law, different uh, uh, parts of trial and appeals where, uh, where forming of arguments is so critical to what we do. Um, but uh, Judge, as I was doing a little research for this, I read a quote from Plato that said, rhetoric is the art of ruling the minds of men. So when lawyers are trying to rule the minds of the judges or the jurors that they appear before, help us understand how we best can do that and how we can be persuasive with the facts that were dealt, assuming that our motion for change of facts has been denied. Um, and we, we find ourselves uh, trying to make, uh, make compelling arguments uh, to someone in your position or, or to a jury or an appellate court. Well, I'll, I'll start. Our topic said the most effective argument is a blank, fill in the blank argument. And uh, having watched lawyers from all sides now, beside me, uh, behind me, in front of me, and so forth, I think the most effective argument, whether it's before a judge or before a jury, is an authentic argument. Um, by definition, almost all of us will argue before judges more than we'll argue before a jury, uh, both in the appellate setting and at the motions setting, and then we'll all hopefully get those rare occasions where we get that highest calling of all, as they say, and that's the opportunity to argue on behalf of a living, breathing human being, whether it be a victim or a defendant or in the case of uh, practicing corporate law before a whole bunch of living, breathing human beings. But whether you're before a judge or whether you're before a jury, I think the biggest guiding principle, the key component should be authenticity. And I'm gonna go through a couple of markers along that line that I've been able to learn by watching very talented lawyers, uh, some of whom exhibit that and some of whom could, could work on that. Um, the first concrete thing I would recommend to you is that at some point in your career, you have someone video, film you, giving a closing uh, or giving a appellate argument. We all think we know what we look like uh, I've sadly found that that can be different in real life than what you think. I'm a golfer. I thought I had really a pretty perfect swing. And then I went to a golf pro who, who uh, filmed me swinging and I just could not believe that that was my posture. And uh, it just looked so differently than I had in my mind's eye. 
And your argument and your style, uh, your stance and uh, methods at the podium may be different than, than you think. And it's worth having uh, someone you trust do that. If you practice in a jurisdiction that allows cameras in the courtroom, then by all means, get, get that and uh, see what you really looked like. And maybe it's what you want to look like. That would be best, but there might be something that you can work on. Um, a lot of it comes down to authenticity. It's hard to be yourself in the courtroom. And there's some reasons for that that are hard to control. It's a sterile setting. Even the furniture can look imposing. The stakes are high. And more and more, we're becoming unfamiliar with that setting. And even fantastic attorneys with excellent reputations simply don't appear in court as often as they used to. And all that sternness, high stakes, unfamiliarity can add up to making you not be you when you get there. And particularly when you're arguing before a jury. You need to be you. Smart or not so smart, rural, urban, whatever they are, they see us more clearly than you think they might. And they have a pretty good detector of who's posing and who's pretending. You need to be you, your best you, no matter who you are or else you come off looking like some a salesperson a little bit with a hard pitch or a 1960s Hollywood version of a lawyer. I like Atticus Finch as much as anybody, but unless you walk and talk like Gregory Peck in real life, don't act like that in the courtroom because it comes across as an act. And of all times, that you need to develop a sincere connection with the people in that box is during closing argument. So you need to be you and take advantage of whatever you have. Being young and, and short can be good. Go with that. Um, being inexperienced can be good. Be honest about that. Don't act like what you think you should do. Uh, now, how do you get to that? This is easier said than done. Um, I have heard people be able to do that by, again, finding somebody that they're close to, a close <coughs> friend, a trusted family member, and delivering your argument to that person, not as though you're a lawyer, but you're just you giving that argument to them. It's a way to cut through the gauze and the artifice of being a lawyer in a suit and a sterile environment and be you arguing for that living, breathing person in front of somebody that you already have a connection to. Whoever it is to show up that day to make that argument to that friend or family member, that's who needs to show up in front of the podium for closing arguments. I'll tell you, you need to be careful in your selection of who to do that. Um, early in my career, I had, I had a 10-year-old niece that moved into my household. And uh, I love her, she's bright, and I practice my closing argument on her. And she, about midway through, I thought, oh, this is golden. Because even though she was a child, she just stood transfixed. Her jaw went slack. She was just staring at me. And the whole way through the end, I'm thinking, this is great. This is really, really powerful. And I stopped. And then she waited a few seconds, and she said, Where's my soccer ball? <laughs> and I realized the whole time she was just being polite and she was waiting to hear me stop for good so she could get on to what mattered to her. It is important to do that, just don't 
pick the right person. I think it will, uh, will go better for you. Uh, don't forget that while you are arguing, at least in front of a jury, your client is sitting unprotected without you there guiding um, him or her. We all concentrate our efforts on preparing that <coughs> client for the witness stand, for direct and for cross-examination, but we have to spend a little bit of time preparing the client for when they're there um, by themselves. While you're arguing, I had an opponent who was, uh, we were trying a case uh, involving two doctors. His doctor was accused of having a hair trigger <coughs> temper and hitting someone, a nurse, in, in the ER. While he got up to close in front of the jury, you look over and the doctor was, it looked like he was chewing gravel. He was so angry and ready to, to snap and really just what the lawyer was trying to argue, he was not. Always, at every stage of a case, think about your client um, and prepare them for, for uh, closings. I do speak at a number of um, CLEs throughout the year. Um, this one differs from a lot in that there does tend to be a fairly high caliber of attendees, so I'm not going to uh, drone on about don't read your, your argument. You know that, and uh, you probably wouldn't be at this seminar if you needed to be told that. Um, I will say, though, that if you are the kind of person that tends to get so nervous with the thought of being at the podium, delivering an important closing with very little notes, then PowerPoint really can come to your aid. It's a wonderful tool because it looks like it's there for the jury to follow, but really it can be your prod uh, to get you through your argument so you don't have to worry about losing uh, the train of thought for important parts. Don't make it too crowded, though, and too dense. Have it as just uh, uh, a way, way markers al along the way. Don't let it eat up uh, too much of your time and focus. I do think it is very effective during closing argument before a jury to pull out key parts of the jury charge that the judge has already uh, indicated will be used. It uh, not only is a chance to emphasize those parts that are so critical to your case, but it is a way to build credibility with the jury. You look very, very smart and prescient to uh, say the very same things that the judge is going to say, and it just it helps build that credibility. Also, perhaps more important, is to take that verdict form uh, that, that is going to be used if you're allowed to in your jurisdictions, put, put that up um, on display and carefully, methodically walk the jury through how you want them to fill it out, even if it is just a simple uh, government and one defendant, one charge, walk them through every part of it. I had, it wasn't a civil context, but it was a, uh, a railroad case. The jury was out for a long time and uh, come to find out what was taking them a long time. They wanted to find for the plaintiff and they weren't sure exactly how to. Um, they did find their way, but that can be more confusing to some people than we think. So it's worth your time to walk them through exactly how you want them to, to fill it out. Um, as far as themes go for closing, um, I like to think I don't have any pet peeves. If I had to pick one, it would probably be not having a theme, but forcing the same theme for every trial. Not every trial is David and Goliath. There are some trials that are Coke and Pepsi. And don't pretend like, you know, Coke is so much bigger than Pepsi. It, it's a theme that often fits, but not always. Themes are a good idea if they're authentic. Um, having said that, um, I do think that certain stock parts of closing arguments are important to give 
even though maybe to you and I, they sound trite. Uh, the burden of proof and the scales that just tip a little bit and so forth, all of those, we may get tired of hearing them, but a closing argument isn't for us. A closing argument is for the jury. And this will, in all likelihood, perhaps be the only closing argument they ever hear. And so, you know, while we see, you know, we're always hearing about red herrings and all, they haven't. This is new to them. So don't be afraid to pull out what seems trite to other people. Uh, it's not necessarily trite to them. A word about the credibility affirmance during argument. Uh, by that, what I mean is a lot of times uh, in opening statements, the lawyers will say, I am going to prove to you during this trial one, two, and three. And they'll go through the, the, the three premises that will be proven at trial. And then sure enough, at closing, they tie that up and say, you know, when we first started, I came before you when I said I was going to prove one, two, and three. Here's how I've done it. And they go through one, two, and three. That can be very powerful. I caution you, though, choose wisely. Make sure that you prove one, two, and three. It's been said that every trial lawyer at heart is a cross between a thespian and a wolf is we like to go in for the hunt and we like to perform. If you are the defense attorney and the prosecutor has said at opening, I'm gonna prove one, two, and three, and they don't prove number two, well, you can go in for the hunt on the most exhilarating stage of it all. And during your closing, you can nail that. Uh, the other concrete um, item I would recommend to you, and this may sound like something you might not need to do, but every once in a while, uh, brush up on the formal rules of logic. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us may have studied that in, in college and then uh, maybe uh, revisited it while prepping for the LSAT. But to go back and look at those every once in a while enables you to very quickly undercut arguments that haven't been properly supported. Uh, it is when, when someone misses a step in the syllogism, when you have in mind the properties of logic, it's just so much easier on your feet to go in uh, for the kill. Finally, with regard to arguments in, in front of the jury, um, it is, uh, I, I think, acceptable, maybe, um, maybe necessary to thank the jury for their time and attention, but I uh, caution you not to take too much time doing that. That can come across as uh, false manners to, to go on and on uh, about it too much. Um, one other thing I do want to mention with regard to arguing before a jury and authenticity, um, I've seen people take a, a very different approach in closing than they did throughout the body of the case. Um, years ago I had a lawyer in front of me who was almost obsequious during the trial very, very, very deferential to the other side, almost apologetic to me when, not almost, overly apologetic when making objections and so forth. And then when it came time for closing, it was this completely different person who was speaking really loudly and uh, casting aspersions on the other side and uh, I'll never forget the jury almost recoiled and they were they were looking at me like, what, <laughs> who, who is this person? So again, authenticity, uh, be yourself and be consistent throughout the trial in being yourself. Um, let me say a few words about arguing before judges, which um, 
uh, again, deserves authenticity and a few other tips that I've observed. Um, when you get a question during argument, don't, don't think something is wrong. That's part of what it's for. <coughs> Sometimes attorneys have prepared uh, so carefully and so completely to give their argument, they almost view it as an intrusion into their monologue. And um, in fact, some simply can't deviate. And it's almost like a, a you know, a hand goes up, no, you know, not, not, not finished, not, not time. This is, your, this is a great opportunity, it's a good thing to get questions because it is a look into the judge's mind uh, about wh what they're thinking about your case. So it's important to listen carefully to it and, and, and answer. Now, there, it can be challenging um, answering. Sometimes judges try to force you into uh, a yes or no uh, construct, perhaps unfairly. And um, nevertheless, it's important to go ahead give the yes or no answer, and then explain why perhaps the premise that started the question is different in this case. So even though the answer was no, doesn't affect this case for this reason. Sometimes you may get a question that um, uh, indicates maybe a lack of full understanding of the facts or the law that, that govern your case. This too is an opportunity to educate the judge uh, the way you want them to be educated. I saw probably the best fielding of such a question that I've ever seen in oral argument at the U.S. Supreme Court. Miguel <coughs> Estrada received a question from a justice and the answer was pretty plainly in a appellate court decision that that very justice had authored. And so instead of sort of being a smarty mouth about it and uh, repeating that answer to the judge, he waited until a subsequent question was asked, found a way <coughs> to then say, oh, as justice so-and-so said in this case, so he got those facts on without offending or embarrassing that judge. Uh, that's a skill. Well, that's I guess why he's arguing where where he's arguing. But it was it was uh, it was such an elegant way of answering. Now, occasionally you may get a question that is so uh, out of left field that you're really flummoxed for how to answer it, and that can be so tricky. Um, early in my career, I was defending uh, a group who got sort of blindsided. Their opponent had gotten a ex parte TRO that essentially froze all of my clients' assets. So we came crawling into the Glen County Superior Court in front of a retired judge, um, asking that that be lifted. And we're arguing, and then he asked me, the judge, well, what does Dracula have to do with this? Um, 25 years later, I still think back, what would have been the best way to answer that? But I just confessed. I said, well, I'm, I'm not sure what you even mean. And uh, come to find out what he meant was I had said something about the order being a draconian order. And so he somehow, um, but we got that, that cleared up. But So you do sometimes get just those, <coughs> and you, you, you just have to be as polite as you can about it. Um, when you are winning, in your argument, is sit down. Um, it, it can only invite trouble and maybe muddy some waters <laughs> that are, are clear in your way. And uh, even on the appellate level, if you still got four and a half minutes ticking on that red clock, just submit the case and, and, and uh, move on. Um, 
the last topic that I wanted to cover was rebuttal arguments before a judge or before a jury. They're crucial and uh, can be so challenging. I know when I was in practice and I would stand up at the podium to give my rebuttal, the paper that I'd walk up with was, was so ugly. You know, it was just a mix of scribbled stuff I couldn't even read and some were words and sentences and it was it just wasn't very helpful and that's because I didn't have a, a methodology for preparing for rebuttal and I now see what talented rebuttal uh, attorneys do and uh, that is just as we all have a, a jury chart you use when for jury selection you got a little box that has like the jury box and you take notes in that, um, you can have a template for rebuttal that has three things you're looking for and you fill them in as your opponent is arguing. Um, the three things that I've seen people look for is uh, facts that the uh, opponent has um, delivered incorrectly during their argument, law that has been mischaracterized, and then any dings that he suffered during argument, whether his own concessions about things or if a, a judge guts the logic underpinning um, or just blank stares that he had in, in uh, answer to questions. You fill in any of those. Uh, I think the most important rebuttals begin by standing up and going back to a question one judge uh, asked and giving that great answer and then lighting into anything you've been able to fill in uh, on, on that box. Um, you want to end then with a zinger with your, your strongest point and uh, sit down. Conceptually, remember that if you're the one doing the rebuttal, you're the one that started. And that is free form and you can't control it very much because of the questions, but you have learned what's bothering them, uh, maybe cleared some things up. But your opponent's argument, that gets fixed. That's it. It's now a target that you can aim at and the rebuttal is, is when you do. Well, Judge, those are, uh, those are, those are great, both theoretical and, and some real practical substantive tips um, that I, I myself appreciate and will take back to my, uh, my firm uh, and my partners. Judge Brown, you uh, don't have the, uh, the breadth of experience on the court yet. Uh, but nonetheless, you have spent decades forming arguments and preparing arguments. Has it, has it changed now that you're uh, on the other side of the bench? Uh, no, it really hasn't. I wish I could tell you that in my long eight months on the bench, <laughs> I had significantly pondered these issues and <laughs> had a lot of pearls of wisdom. I can't tell you that. I will tell you the one rule that I'm going to have in my courtroom about an effective argument, which is I don't want someone to say to me, with all due respect, because I know what that means. <laughs> and it doesn't mean that you have respect. It's like saying for what it's worth. So I've, that's the only thing I can tell you that has hardened in my heart uh, in these short eight months. So please get the word out on that. <laughs> um, other than that, and I, I, I do wish that I had, and I, I I have seen some very good arguments already. I've had a number of trials and I've had, I'm sort of spending this year having a lot of arguments because I'm learning a lot from the lawyers in front of me because of the divert, it's amazing how diverse your docket is as a district court judge. Uh, and so I'm spending a lot of time doing that. I wish I could give you a lot of precision in what I have thought effective or not so far. I, I really find solidified um, effective argument being the type of argument that I found effective when I was a prosecutor uh, or when I was a criminal defense lawyer. And, and it is 
I think you could use words like authentic or honest like Judge Wood did, but I mean it a little differently. And the word that I've used, and I'm sure some of you like Meredith have heard me use before, Mitch, is a moral argument. I, um, I don't mean like my client is a moral person and a very good person. That's not what I mean by moral, and maybe that's not the right word for it. But what I, what I find to be the most effective argument, and this is why I echo some of Judge Wood's sentiments, is an argument that, that genuinely accepts the facts that are there in the case, and one that accepts the law that's in the case. I mean, you're, you're really, you, you brought up uh, a beginning of this, how can we rule the minds of men or women? I really, as much as we all like to think a trial lawyer can do that, I really don't think that you can change what the facts are or change what the law is or convince a jury or a judge to do something that is truly unsupported by the facts uh, or by the law. But there's always a way in most cases, and sometimes it's, it's harder in some criminal cases than others, but there is usually a straight-faced argument that you can make on behalf of your client. And maybe it has to do with the witness's credibility, or maybe it has to do with the burden of proof, which I also think is a very strong argument. But Steve Salter, I don't know if you all know him, he has this really old, gnarly poster board with the burden of proof printed out on it. And he comes into trial, and all these other lawyers have got PowerPoints, and, all, and he just pulls up this gnarly looking thing and he pulls out a chair and he lays it on a chair. But it, it is obviously one of the most important parts of the criminal justice system and something that I think is one of the most important arrows that a criminal defense lawyer has in their quiver to say to somebody, you would act without hesitation in the most important of your own affairs. So that maybe is, is where it comes in. It could be that there's a missing witness. It could even be, and a lot of times is, especially in white collar crime, crime cases, something to do with your client's state of mind. But if you're talking to your niece or you're talking to your husband or wife or your child or your partner and you're telling them what your theory of the case is and they're looking at you like you just can't believe they're, they're saying this, that's not a very uh, acceptable argument. You need to go back. You need to tinker with it. That's not a moral argument. And I don't find uh, uh, those arguments very persuasive. I mean, juries, they're all very, by the end of a trial, I think they are all very impressed by their role in the case. I think they've had judges and jurors treating them respectfully for days or sometimes weeks. I think that they're told not to talk to every, anybody. I think that they are treated in a very respectful way that maybe is not the way that they're treated when they're an orderly at the hospital. And so I think that typically by the end of the trial, I think jurors are very um, respectful of what their role is. And if you tell them that their role is to apply these rules of law to these facts with this burden of proof and this presumption of innocence, I think that is a far more um, moral and acceptable argument for these people than to try to convince them that something didn't happen that we all know happened. And I'll, I'll give you an example. And some of you that know me are tired of hearing me talk about the trial that I had last year, but it was my last trial, so it's very <laughs> special to me. I represented a guy uh, in, a, in a securities fraud case up in Connecticut. He and his coworkers were accused of lying when they bought and sold bonds. The strength of the government's case was that they lied when they bought and they sold those bonds. <laughs> the second best thing the government had going for them was that those lies were documented in black and white in the chat logs that they kept to comply with SEC rules. And so if they bought a bond for 58 and they wanted to sell it for 62, they'd say that they bought it 61. They would not say I bought it at 58, but want to sell it at 62. So the government had a pretty strong case. And it's hard when you have, you know, you know the government's going to make the argument that something like this 
even a fifth grader knows it's wrong to lie. So we were tasked with the idea of how are we going to make a jury believe sometimes it's okay to lie. And Mitch Mitchelson has got this very good common sense approach. And so he's like, hey, if you're trying to convince them that sometimes it's okay to lie, yeah, because I'm not going to convince him that my client didn't type the words, I bought it at 61 when he really bought it at 59. There was another side of the case. We had some co-defendants, and they wanted to argue a lot of issues having to do with materiality and, and the size of the banks, and, and it did really matter to them. And it's hard, again, I thought, to make a moral argument about that when you got the guy that says, I want to pay 58. No, I bought it at 60. Okay, I'll pay 61. It's hard to argue that it didn't matter to that person. And so we, we argued a state of mind defense, and we argued that the reason that a 35-year-old man who's college educated and has MBA thinks it's okay to lie is because that's what he was taught to do the entire time he was in the industry. It is what his supervisors were doing at the very time of his arrest. It's what the guy down the hall was doing. And by the way, it's probably what the counterparties were doing because half of them came from his company to begin with. And it wound up being a case that when we tried it, we, we could stand in front of the jury at the end and talk about what was in our client's heart and, and why our client is a good person and why they could go back in there and they could say, you know what, I've, they've opened up and they've told us what the facts are and they've accepted those facts. And as it turns out, they had a path when you looked at the burden of proof and you looked at what is willful, the definition of willful, to intentionally do something that the law forbids, you had a path through it. And so I felt like I felt when I was a government lawyer uh, standing up in my closing argument, like I had the side of righteousness with me uh, rather than with the government, even though my client had, I don't know, 25 lies through the course of 15 counts or whatever it was. And it wound up working for our client. It didn't do so well for the co-defendants. And I truly believe it was because we gave a jury of 14 or 12 people that actually deliberated a way that they could feel good about the job that they had done by following the rules in a way that wasn't tricking them or trying to get them to do something uh, that you could not ask your eight-year-old niece to do without her looking at you like, what? Um, so that's, that's sort of the one thing I would say. I, I, and I see it, even now I see it. I had a case recently where uh, it was just an argument. It was a civil case, and it was a, a summary judgment. And, you know, it, it was, I'm amazed at how much briefing goes into summary judgment. And I really learned that I cannot begin preparing for a summary judgment motion two days before. It's really got to be so much longer because what the lawyers can put together is so very dense and, and important, but it takes a while to unpack. And I get into my courtroom, and I have the move-in go first, and they're just killing the plaintiff with all of the things the plaintiff cannot prove. They can't prove this. They don't have a witness that says that. Their expert won't ad has admitted this. Our expert says this, and they can't prove all of these other things, and all of which was disputed in the statement of material facts, and I had read it. And then the plaintiff's lawyer gets up, and he says, you know, I get why he says all of that, and he's right. We can't do this, and we can't do that. I've got this one thing going for me, Judge, and this is the one piece of evidence that I have going for me that I think they can't dispute. And it really, uh, in my mind, I haven't decided how that's going to go, but when I left the bench and I went back into chambers and I was talking with my law clerk, and he was really impressed with how the movement's position was, I said, yeah, but I got to tell you, I think the issue is whether that one piece is enough to get him to a jury. And that's now the whole, my whole analysis has got nothing to do with all the great things that the defendant said. It's got to do with that one thing because he admitted that all of the, the, the plaintiff's lawyer admitted all of the bad things for his case. And he concentrated on the one good thing and his belief that under this one part of the law, he's allowed to get to a jury. And, and it really, in my mind, and I'm trying to get my law clerk to agree with me, 
it shifted the <laughs> dynamic of the entire case from one that was overwhelmingly for one side to one that was like, yeah, but they can't get around this. Uh, and so I, I find, I don't have much else to say about that uh, or about, about effective arguments because I'm not there yet. I just, I still believe that that authentic is the word that maybe I'm going to steal now and use it. But I don't mean it in terms of be yourself. I mean it in terms of a moral uh, argument. I got that word from a, a judge in Fulton County. Y'all ever go in front of Bedford Jackson? I had a trial in front of him that was a guy who was accused of uh, possessing child pornography. And he couldn't believe this case went to trial. I couldn't believe this case went to trial. I never thought I would sit there and watch the jury look at some of these images. But we had a statute of limitations defense in that case. And he pulled me aside afterwards and he told me how much he did not want to try that case and how angry he was that we were actually going to show those images to a jury. And then he said, but I get it. Because in one of the most immoral type of cases there is, you tried a moral case. And that's where I get that word from. My client was convicted but didn't get jail time. So it was a, it worked out the way we wanted because we were really playing that for the judge. The government was demanding an excessive sentence and the judge wound up not providing any jail time for him because he understood what our defense was. And so I, I know that when you're trying a criminal case, sometimes you've got really bad things like wiretaps or confidential sources. I know that I'm not suggesting you can, you, you have to, make an argument that makes your guy look good. I'm simply saying that you're not going to convince the jury that the evidence is not largely what the government says the evidence is. You're better off trying to find and give them a moral path that doesn't deny things, but that shows them how what their duty is in this situation, in this artificial situation that we have as the court of law, that their duty is to find on this moral path for your client. That's really all I Judge, let me, let me ask you this. The, the and now I've used all my good trial stories. So, <laughs> I mean. Well, the, the point you make, I think, is an excellent one, that, that your argument has to be pure when you're standing in front of the people who are going to evaluate it. How do you convince that first listener of the argument, your client, eight months ago when you, before you were a judge, and you had to convince your client, well, we're going to go in front of the jury and I'm going to concede these four things that you did. Because that, to get to the, to the moral argument, you need to get your client on board on some of those instances. Or, or you just need to tell them, look, you hired me. This is how we're doing it. Uh, maybe not the most effective way to build that relationship with the client. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that occurs from or arises from the time you spend with your client going through the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. And I get that. I mean, uh, it, it is a, a leap of faith and, and you know, it, it is, in my opinion, having somebody trust you to try their case and defend them is really one of the biggest um, honors or pieces of trust that you can put in somebody that you're not married to, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, somebody that's paying you. Uh, and it, it, is, it is hard to do, but it comes over time. It, it, right. it comes over time when, when, and some of it is arguing with your client. Some of it is your client telling you something that you know is just not going to float a boat in that courtroom. And it takes some time to do it. I frankly think it takes time working with other lawyers, right? I had, in the case I was telling you about in Connecticut, we did a mock examination of one of my, of my client. I was not going to do the examination of him um, we didn't think he should testify and we didn't, he was trying to say things weren't lies that were lies. Not complete candor, not absolute truthfulness. I mean, this, and, and one of my partners, Mitchelson, he, he cross-examined him and it was one of the worst experiences of that client's life. And he recognized at that point that maybe there, that can't be. Just because you want to say something, it doesn't mean that you can say it in a persuasive way in the court of law. So I, I just think it takes I think it takes some time and some pushing and, and uh, I guess building up their trust. So Professor, we turn to you now. Uh, and you spend, uh, in your time at the U.S. Attorney's Office, you spent a significant portion of your time reading through arguments and, and helping uh, other lawyers, in addition to crafting your own arguments, but helping other lawyers uh, craft arguments. 
Uh, and now as a professor, you're making a study of it, uh, which, which we all appreciate because we all look to get better and learn from you. Um, tell us what, uh, what you're finding now in your new role and, and contrast it with, uh, with your days uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office. So um, I couldn't agree more with the statements that um, Judge Brown and Judge Wood made. I'm going to take a slightly different tact and talk a little bit about what makes an argument from an appellant sense. And um, really, at the end of the day, there are certain fundamentals. But at the end of the day, what makes an argument is what the court thinks makes an argument. Uh, as Bill mentioned, I was a former, I'm a former AUSA. In fact, I've only been a law professor for a year. I just left DOJ about a year ago. And I spent my time at DOJ mainly trying, uh, I was tried criminal trial and appellate work. And for a number of years, I was in the appellate division. And when I was appellate chief of the division, the office had a policy that the appellate chief would attend argument with every individual that had argument, even if it wasn't the appellate chief's argument. So we had a case, a public corruption case, and during the time I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, we had a ton of public corruption cases. But we had a pretty high-profile public corruption case that got oral argument. And most public corruption cases in the 11th Circuit do get oral argument. And there are always, as you know, significant number of issues. And so we prepared a tremendous number. We prepared uh, my colleague who wrote the brief and was going to argue, did a phenomenal job on the brief. We had two moots where we fully mooted every issue. But those of you who do oral argument recognize that there are some issues that you think are more likely to be the subject of the argument. Even though you're preparing every issue, you kind of cull down and you think these are the cases that, these are the issues that Jen will be argued. So we go to argument. I'm there both for moral support, evaluative purposes, supervisory purposes, and also if any assistance is needed. So the case is called. My colleague and I are sitting at council table. And the presiding judge stands up. And instead of saying, government, you may proceed, says, you know, government, this argument that you have uh, is really, really problematic. And at that point, we knew we were going to lose counts. That, that had never happened to me before, and that is obviously not a good sign. It was pretty clear that they had decided those counts are gone. And what was very important about this is we had a companion case that involved the same charging. And so if those counts were gone, it was going to affect another case. It would be a big deal. And so my colleague, while the judge is speaking, it looks, kind of looks at me for words of wisdom. And all I could say was, oh, expletive, under my breath, and good luck. <laughs> so I tell that story for two reasons. One is, we had mooted everything, but we did not think this was an argument that the court was going to find so compelling. Even though we were prepared, we had briefed it, and two, I, I'd like to be a little more help to you than I was to my colleague. So what I have done is I have um, done a search of 11th Circuit case law and tried to find every case that has been reversed in the last 10 years. Now, this is non-scientific in the sense is I used a number of incredibly broad search terms and got about 600 cases. And then I culled through those 600 cases and came out with all the white collar cases. I eliminated any of the skilling, post-skilling cases because that's something that, that's settled, that's not going to happen, you don't have to worry about that. So I came up with basically 18 categories, I mean uh, 18 cases, that's it. And these are the categories of the cases. Sufficiency of the indictment, variance, sufficiency of the evidence, expert testimony, jury instructions, sentencing enhancements, and forfeiture. I could predict, based on my experience, that sentencing enhancements were probably going to be the cases that are most likely reversed on appeal. And there were seven of, the, of, the, of, this, of these categories, seven of the cases that were reversed were sentencing enhancement cases. The next highest number was sufficiency of the evidence. And honestly, in terms of white collar cases and public corruption cases, that actually kind of surprised me. However, a number of these five cases involve statutory interpretation. So to me, that explains it. And then pretty much the, all the others were one case, except for forfeiture was two. So um, 
I know we don't have a lot of time and you want to probably ask questions of the judges, so I'm just gonna go over a couple. In sentencing enhancement, it breaks down to three categories, abuse of trust, loss amount, and supervisory role. And y'all probably could have predicted that. Um, in terms of abuse of trust, probably the seminal case is this case, U.S. v. Gertler. And Gertler involved a defendant who was actually on supervisory release out of the Southern District of New York, moved to Florida, the Middle District of Florida. And this guy was pretty clever. He investigated the structure of a number of large law firms and large corporations, figured out who was general counsel, who had a lot of offices, which companies would be least likely to know if he was pretending to be general counsel so he could get money from them? There were 14 victims in this case. This guy would call the office and say, I'm so-and-so. He'd give his name, but I'm general counsel, and I'm about to settle a case, or I'm assistant general counsel. I'm about to settle a case. I need a wire immediately for this amount. And he got it between a million and $1.5 million. So he was sentenced, he was convicted, he was sentenced, and he was, the court applied the two-level abuse of trust enhancement. On appeal, the defense challenged that and said he was not in a position of trust. The district court had relied on the fact that there's an application note three to the guidelines saying that imposters, someone who's an imposter, also qualifies for abuse of trust. The 11th Circuit reversed saying this gentleman was not in a position of trust. He had no position of trust related to any of these people. And the imposter provision actually applies to somebody who misrepresents that, let's say, I'm a stockbroker. I'm going to misrepresent I'm a stockbroker. Through that misrepresentation, I'm going to have a relationship with you. So the court reversed, and uh, the defendant's sentence was reduced from 185 months to 162 months. The loss amount, the, the, the largest number of cases that were reversed are loss amount cases. Um, and the loss amount case is this U.S. v. Stein. Stein was a lawyer. He represented uh, a company called Signal Life. And he managed to inflate the stock price by putting up false prospectuses and purchase orders. And by doing so, he inflated the stock price. There were about 2,000 victims and the, based on the 2,000 victims, the loss was extremely high. And as you all know, the loss amount is going to drive the guidelines. So his sentence ended up being 204 months based on the loss amount. Defense appealed, arguing that the loss amount calculation was improper. And the basis for that was is that to prove actual loss, you have to prove that the loss, that the victim, the defendant's conduct is the but-for cause of the victim's loss and that the gover did, government didn't prove that for each of the cases. And so that case was remanded, and he was resentenced to 150 months. So his sentence went down 64 months, which is significant. Then the other, the other category within the loss amount would be supervisory role. And so I won't go into all those cases. I will provide that information to um, the meeting supervisor because I know probably people have questions. So again, here are the other areas. I will give, send a list of all these cases, which uh, all of them except one case are published cases, so they would be helpful in terms of any of these areas. And then I'll let, I'm, I'm sure people have questions for the court. Okay, great, thank you. And, and now I know how easy it is to increase settlement authority. I had no idea that I could just <laughs> pose as the GC and get the money. Uh, well, that's very helpful, and I think that project that you're uh, undertaking and the cases that you've uh, outlined and identified for us would probably be welcome for everybody to have as, as part of their practice and, uh, and a great uh, resource tool for us all. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, though, Professor, was, uh, was the expert witness um, and the reversal on that. That's a, that's a big developing issue uh, in Florida where I'm from because believe it or not in Florida state courts Daubert uh, some would argue is not the law of the land uh, the trial bar has fought that aggressively uh, in the state legislature uh, the legislature has passed Daubert the trial bar has challenged it before the Supreme Court 
Um, but expert hearings and Daubert hearings are, uh, are a hot button issue throughout, uh, throughout my state. And for any of you who, who live and practice there or occasionally have cases there, or your clients uh, there, I think it would be interesting to, uh, to hear from either of the judges. Um, when you're looking at, at expert uh, testimony and deciding whether to, uh, to permit it, whether it's in a civil case, because a lot of people in the audience are involved in civil cases in, the, in a key tam uh, type setting, or in a criminal case, um, what are the things that you're looking for in that in, uh, to help guide you in your gatekeeper uh, function under Daubert? Um, I'll begin because Daubert is the law in the Southern District right. of Georgia and right. um, all over in, in um, federal law, and so that its precepts are our touchstone. One trend I'm seeing as far as Dalbert goes, and this is not just in the civil area, but in criminal cases as well, is uh, uptick in the variety mm -hmm. of, uh, it's not just gun experts, blood experts, but all kinds of creative uh, experts have been qualified under Dalbert. Uh, not too many years ago, we had a employee of the Jacksonville Zoo who came as a snake expert in a, a black mamba case. Um, I don't see much pushback on, from whoever is, is the proponent of the expert. Well, the Black Mama case goes to the diversity of docket that you were talking about earlier, Judge Brown. I'm afraid uh, I don't know what a Black Mama case is. <laughs> Have you seen uh, Daubert challenges uh, in the criminal context, whether it's a, a loss expert? I know we have uh, people in the crowd who, uh, who are practitioners and, and uh, outside experts frequently. Uh, some of our, our sponsors for the conference who we appreciate who are who are here are performing that role and uh, have you seen some of those challenges uh, in your court yet? I have I have one um, I, I have it in at least one case right now um, I mean it, it, you know I, I had that come up sometimes when I was on the other side when I was with the defense it's um, I never had anybody push back too hard on a expert in a criminal defense. Um, there is some pushback from the U.S. Attorney's Office in this one matter that I have. Um, I don't want to sound like Kavanaugh, but I don't think I can say anything else about it. But, uh, <laughs> no. it, I, and it, it we're it, not <laughs> asking you to. Yeah, I think it, I think it is hard to, to, to keep out an expert unless there's some fairly good grounds from the civil side in a criminal case. It's just. I mean, it's really the opportunity that that person has to make that argument. And, and I, I, in a lot of the civil cases I have, there's a lot of Daubert challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and I find myself thinking, yeah, but if this was criminal uh, mm -hmm. sometimes. So. Right. And, and the criminal case that I was going to talk about, U.S. v. Reddy, that's the exact circumstance where the court did not allow the expert to yeah. testify. And that was reversible error. Yeah. You know, there's always a lot in... in my, my recollection is there's always a lot also between the confusion between lay and expert, more so in the criminal context mm -hmm. than in the civil context, uh, and I think that allows a little bit more fluidity. How are they challenging Daubert if it's in 702? This is in the state court system okay. in Florida, which has the Fry system, which allows what's called pure opinion. So on the civil side, you can have an expert who will say, I tested this in my garage, and that company is totally liable for it, right? So it, it gets it gets everything past summary judgment, right? So there's a, a lot of lot of concern about that, but has been for decades, right? Uh, so it's a much longer story than uh, than our, our panel time permits. Yeah, that's another question. Yeah, I certainly want to have uh, people from the audience. If uh, if any of you have questions, this is a great chance. Um, and I would also encourage our newest lawyers, our first time attendees to this conference, don't be bashful. Um, feel free to, uh, to ask questions. Yes, sir. So, Judge Brown, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I work for uh, federal judges and, and participated on both sides of criminal sentencing hearings, and, you know, oftentimes federal judges have to observe. That's one of the more difficult things to do is, is to impose a sentence in a criminal case. And, you know, having your extensive experience also as a prosecutor and defense attorney, anything that for you on a sentencing hearing as a judge that you sort of observed that you hadn't before? 
Um, I don't know. I, I, I was surprised at how hard I found sentencing hearings. I haven't had any big, ugly sentencing hearings so far. I've had a couple of fraud and some other ones. I haven't had any that, but, but it, it was surprising to me how hard I find that role to be. Um, I also have found that I, I care more about the things that I hear about the person outside of the criminal activity a lot more than maybe I appreciated when I was uh, a prosecutor or a defense lawyer. I mean, it is, you know, you read the PSR and then we get this little recommendation from the probation officer. I guess everybody knows we get a recommendation from the probation officer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, and it, it's all just so clinical. And it's really, it's hard by the end of it when you walk in and there's a person, and I had a sentencing this week, this woman had, I, I think, five children and like nine grandkids in the background. And it just, it's, it is awful. And, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, it was, it was very hard. I felt like the argument that I heard that talks about what else this person was doing with their life was helpful to me to understand the broader picture under 3553 and that, you know, this is a person who is like everybody else, um, not perfectly straight uh, and all of whatever the word is, what's the word about wood, uneven wood or, you know the saying. Nothing. I'm thinking. I don't yet, but I'll have your. <laughs> I'll come to it in a minute. But it, it, uh, you know, it, it is just a lot harder than I would have expected. It's a lot more emotional. Everybody told me to be prepared for that, and I, all I can say is I read the PSR very hard. I read all the sentencing memos. It's really easy to tell me really the bad things this person did and their criminal history. It's a lot harder to let me understand it. A lot more effective to let me understand what else this person had going on. Crooked timber, that's the word. <laughs> Nothing straights everybody, you don't, don't know that saying? No. Nothing straights everybody made by the crooked timber of humanity? You don't know? Okay. Well, Judge Wood, I think that's an important time too where you really need to be authentic. You talked about it earlier, but boy, it, if, if you're trying to portray the picture of a, of a client, uh, pure as the driven snow, but for this one incident, um, that's really gonna backfire. I think um, sort of piggybacking on what you were saying one of the most challenging aspects about sentencing, and it raises its head uh, more so than ever in white collar crime cases, is I think every judge has to strive to not treat people differently who have a similar background to you and not let anything about your own personal experience change one way or the other, either too much of a pushback or too much the other way based on who you are. You, you really have to strive to remove your personal characteristics from any part of the sentencing equation, which is in some ways an impossible thing to do, but something that you have to, to try to do. And uh, just because someone may have a similar background issue or similar education or uh, be as articulate as some of your friends or have the same number of children you have, you cannot let that influence yourself in any way. And a, a judge who says that that's easy to do is not self-aware. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah, the, the section has done a lot of work studying on implicit bias, uh, which is what you're talking about, and, and worked with prosecutors' offices, defense uh, offices, and the court. So I would commend the research uh, to all of you that the criminal ABA criminal justice section has done on that. Sir, you had a question. Um, I think some of the most effective expert witnesses have a real conversation with the jury. Some of them almost take over, and and they hardly look at the attorney that is questioning them. They pivot toward the jury box, and um, the the great ones have that um, 
almost teacher-like quality where um, they become the authority figure, the font of knowledge, and they're explaining it to the jury, and the jury is taking copious notes. Um, again, that witness that binds uh, with the jury. I think then on cross, it's very important to be direct and answer uh, the questions given, not look evasive, concede the given things. Uh. I, I don't have much else to add other than there can't be too much of a difference between your demeanor on cross and on direct, right? Because then they, you're just reinforcing the fact that you're paid by that guy and not that guy. Um, <laughs> But I, I, otherwise, I, I agree with everything that, that, that Judge Wood has said. Any other questions? Joe? I'm just curious about. Uh, that I found the training to be very effective. Um, Judge Brown probably has finished at least one phase of new judges school, both phases. So they take you in for um, two rounds of fairly intense training before uh, experienced judges, and they cover um, the different process-wise and then issue-wise. Um, it's best to do it when you've actually had to be on the bench for a while so you know what you don't know, and um, they do phase one, and then a little bit later, they do phase two. Um, on top of that, every year, there's um, court level specific training that you do at least one course, sometimes two or three. Um, so magistrate judges have their own training, district court judges, appellate judges. So um, you go, like I said, on average to about two of those trainings. They are topic specific and the judges themselves drive the selection of topics, so each year the Federal Judicial Center, which is created for the sole purpose of training judges, um, comes up with a, a whole cafeteria um, selection of different cases, anything from handling um, high profile national security cases to you know just your bread and butter um, employment law cases. And I'm really impressed with the level of expertise from the um, academic world that they bring in to help with those uh, retired judges and and so forth. Then they have a mid-career uh, long training like you just did, uh, phase one, phase two, for judges who have been on the bench longer than five years but fewer than ten. And that's a whole, you're kind of hitting your stride as a judge and uh, a whole different layer of training. So to put a point on it, the opportunities are, are pretty copious and, and really well done. I, I, um, I didn't love the training that I went through. Um, I thought a lot of it was uh, organizational based. Um, you know, how to keep your docket, how to monitor your docket, things of that nature. I, uh, and it could be that I went through it pretty early in my time. I find this to be just an incredible amount of on-the-job training that I never would have expected. You know, I, I go to church, and when you're in church, you know, the priest tells you what to do. You know, you kind of know when to stand or sit or respond. There's none of that now when you're on the bench. You're the one that's sort of running everything, and I was not, uh, that I find very, was not part of any training that I got. Um, uh, I also felt like um, on the criminal side, which is an area that I felt very comfortable, there was a lot of training on the sentencing guidelines. And I, I felt like that was, there was some, there was too much on the sentencing guidelines. And they, they took us to this prison for a tour so we would know where people we sentenced might go to. Only the prison that they took us to was a women's prison that's also a healthcare facility for women so it was the tamest place you could ever be. I mean, it, literally there was like a hobby room with bunnies painted on the wall. And, and in their dorms, they had poster boards where people could write notes to each other wishing them happy Valentine's Day. We were there over that holiday. And it was just kind of, I didn't find it very effective. I, outside of Fort Worth? 
Yeah. It, well, I w actually had uh, arranged to go down and look at the Atlanta pen because I think that's a little bit more of a realistic idea of when you decide to send somebody to prison, what what their next X number of years might be. So I didn't love it. I, I do, I, a lot of people that I have met, they really did enjoy it more when they had a little bit of better understanding uh, of the basicness of being a judge that I don't think I had yet. So and it, it, I great. think it does depend on who's doing yeah. your training. You, you yeah. apparently had sort of a touchy-feely year. Ours was a little more <laughs> um, boots on the ground. And they're, they're trying to go toward more of an experiential uh, yeah. whole learning base, which is good. They make you uncomfortable as a judge. Um, they make you, in front of your colleagues, for example, um, conduct a pretrial conference where one of the litigants is pro se and keeps interrupting and asking inappropriate questions. They video you and then we watch everybody do it and critique everyone. And you know training is good when you're not bored doodling at your desk, but you're sort of suffering some embarrassment and tension. That That's, yeah. I think it's moving in a good direction. Can I add one more part to that? I did, I did think they did a sentencing, um, they did a couple sentencing examples for us. And it was, what it was shocking to me about it was the disparity wow. in where we all would have come at. It was maybe 15 or so of us. We were all Trump appointees. So there was not a huge diversity in the judges. But the diversity in the sentence that they would have given was enormous and, and something that I, I, as you might be able to tell, I struggle with the concept of sentencing. It was enormous how, we all know it, if you get this judge, you're gonna be really well off. If you get that judge, you might get hammered. And so it, that to me was, the, was a very eye-opening moment for me, of, of, for me personally, to look at things like disparity in sentencing and, and how to avoid that. But that, that's, that was the most poignant part for me, that and the bunnies on the wall. <laughs> great. Well, thank you all. And, you know, I think this is one of the great parts of this conference. And, and thank all of you for being here and participating. Uh, it's been a very special opportunity to have, uh, have these panelists help me thank them for uh, coming and joining us today.